<laughs> All right. Uh, once I start, I got 20 minutes. So let me get ready and start. OK, I haven't done this question, so I'll go ahead and do it. So it says, consider a long, thin rod with, OK, um, its radius is negligible. OK, uh, so point mess there. Setup that is shown here. A very light rope is stretched. OK, yeah. So it looks like a static equilibrium setup, um, which, you know, that was last said. So there must be some wave part added here. So the, but the first question is asking for tension in the rope. So we'll do that. Um, yeah. Let me follow my own advice and draw a separate free body diagram. Um, I know there's a temptation to just to, you know, copy this figure and start drawing forces on it, which you can, you know, it's not all that wrong, but let me follow my own advice. So I'm following the standard strategy steps, starting with a free body diagram, and I'm starting with a kind of extended object because I need to indicate where the force is acting. So this rod has some mass, I think. Or rather, some yeah, mass m uniformly distributed, uh, and yeah, yeah, length l. So the gravity acting on the rod, it'll act like it's acting at the center of mass. So I have gravitational force mg acting on the rod, and there's a sphere at the end. So I'll have another gravitational force acting on the combination of sphere and the rod, capital mg, and um, the rope, it's probably applying some tension force. So let me draw that tension force to the left. And as you're drawing this free body diagram, you should be asking yourself the question, did I draw all the forces? And here, given that acceleration should be zero, it should be quite clear to you that you didn't draw all the forces yet. And the remaining balance of the force, it's really going to be at the hinge, at the pivot point. There will be some kind of force there whose sole role is to make sure that net force adds up to zero. So unless we are being asked for the pivot force, um, like a net force equation won't tell us anything because we have this force standing by here to make sure the static equilibrium condition is just enforced. Um, so where it's asking for the tension in the rope, um, so you know in static equilibrium scenarios, you have two static equilibrium conditions to enforce that net force is equal to zero and net torque is equal to zero. This, as I said, won't really be useful because we have this unknown pivot force unless we are looking for it. Like they, they, it, um, the, the, this equation just serves to give us what the pivot force is. So we are just going to use the net torque equation with our center of rotation set up here. So that whatever the pivot force is, we don't have to know it. We don't care. <laughs> We're not going to find it. So we only have to worry about the torque due to these one, two, three forces. So let me define the coordinate axis with respect to these forces um, in terms of torque. Defining coordinate axis amounts to deciding which direction is positive. I'm going to say clockwise is positive. So the tension force, it's going counterclockwise. That must be that's going to be labeled as negative. So that's one thing you need to do. And, um, and that's step number two. Step number three, we you know break down forces into components. I guess a version of that that applies when you're calculating torque is figuring out the lever arm. So um, with the gravitational forces here, I'm just extending the line of action. These are the lever arms for mg and lever arm for capital mg. And for the tension force extending the line of action, this perpendicular segment is lever arm. I hope once you draw the lever arm lines, you can kind of see the triangular geometry. Um, are we given the angle? Um, ah, it makes a 60 degree angle with the floor. So we are given this angle theta. So, um, so once you have the angle and you got these, uh, you know, these triangles identified, Hopefully you have good sense of oh this is the trick relationship I should use for the um, for the lever arm for these forces. So let me just do everything in one shot. I'm going to go to step number four, writing my uh, net torque Newton's second law equation, the net torque equation. 
my net torque is going to be, let me start with the gravitational force, the level R, this segment times the force, and this segment, I can see that is the, the adjacent side of a, a hypotenuse of length L over 2. So it will be L over 2, oops, uh, lowercase, uppercase L, L over 2 times cosine theta, that's the level R, times mg. Okay, I can see that I'm going to run out of space, so let me move this over and uh, have more space here. So... So that's one contribution to torque. I have a second contribution to torque from the other gravitational force. That's going to be the hypotenuse of L adjacent side still. So it's going to be L cosine theta times capital Mg. And the tension force minus, it's going counterclockwise. And this level arm, so I guess I'm going to try to identify this angle within the triangle. That's going to be this theta here. So it's the opposite side. And uh, this length, I think I was given yeah, two-thirds of the way up, so it's going to be 2L over 3. So that level arm will be 2L over 3 sine theta times the, uh, let me zoom out a little bit, times the tension force T. And all of this, the sum of all the torque, they should be equal to zero. That's what the question says. How am I doing on time? I might have to go quite faster. So, okay, uh, I have one equation, and I think uh, I'm correct in saying that the tension is the only thing unknown here, so let me just solve for tension. I think the quickest way to do it is to move this term over to the other side, that's a zero, and multiply through by 3 over 2L times the sine theta. So after I've done that, what you should get is, I'm just going to do that in my head, T is equal to, 3 over 2L sine theta times L over 2 cosine theta mg plus L cosine theta big mg. Um, let me do a little bit of factoring, a little bit of simplification. Uh, L's cancel, that's nice. Um, and I think I can factor out cosine theta g from both terms. And then uh, let me just put the term together first. I have 3 cosine theta g over 2 sine theta times a small m over 2 plus big M. And just one last bit of simplification. I can write sine over cosine as tangent theta to get 3g m over 2 plus big M divided by to tangent theta. Interesting. I, I don't know if I might have expected that or well, <laughs> tension is equal to 3 times g times m over 2 plus m divided by 2 times tangent uh, theta. Um, as the theta goes to 0, t goes to infinity, I guess that makes sense. Um, Okay, uh, let's see. Suppose that the, ah, so this is the wave part. <laughs> Setting up standing waves on the rope. What are the frequencies of these standing waves on the rope? Oh, okay. Um, I think from that picture, uh, I, I, so let me actually copy that picture now. From that picture, I can, uh, the thing I can get easily is the shape of the standing waves. So, for part B. Eleven minutes. I got three more parts. Okay, I'll have to go a little bit more quickly. So what I can get easily are the shapes of standing waves. And what I can tell you um, is the one with the longest wavelength will look like this. The one with the next longest wavelength will look like this. You know, know that both ends. And, and so on. So my longest wavelength, that wavelength will be this length here, let me call that capital D times 2. And the next one will be um, D. And just uh, working out the geometry in my head, I know um, this is a 2L over 3. Um, and this is a theta. So um, the adjacent side, this is the expression that should hold. D should be um, 2L over 3 cosine theta which means the 
the first wavelength there will give me um, something like a 4L over 3 cosine theta and so the rest I can get from harmonics. So uh, it's uh, one of the three lowest frequencies or the three longest wavelength. So once I have um, wavelengths that I can get the frequency from this relationship. Frequency is working at the unit, one over second. So it's going to be the speed, wave speed divided by the wavelength. Now, here's a formula that you kind of need to have memorized or at a minimum know how to look it up in a textbook. Wave speed of wave on string is given by this formula, by square root of tension divided by what's called the linear mass density. <laughs> you should start to know it. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah, they give you the linear mass density. That's great. Um, <laughs> so we worked out the tension, which means, um, so I'm going to just write this down. V is equal to square root of T divided by mu. I'm treating T as a known quantity because I worked it out in A above. Um, um, where T is same as in A. And given this V, I can write down the expression for frequency. Frequencies are f equals v over lambda, and I'm just gonna describe the three longest uh, wavelengths. Uh, three longest wavelengths is giving three lowest frequencies are uh, lambda one of four uh, l over three times cosine theta. Lambda two is it's gonna be half of that. 12 over 3 times cosine theta and lambda 3 will be a third of the fundamental uh, wavelength for well theta um, uh, work through the relationships for f and v for frequency values just gonna leave it there. Uh, this uh, gives all the necessary information. Uh, the answer is in terms of known quantities, at least known in theory. Okay, seven minutes. <laughs> um, there were some approximations made in order to give an answer in a mu being very small. Uh, uh, make the approximation please uh, imagine the. Uh, so gent yeah. So uh, this is trying to give a hint. Uh, one of which is that. Uh, I assume the, that the tension force is the one calculated in A. Maybe if the string is plucked hard, the uh, tension force uh, will change. Um, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> um, especially if the rod vibrates enough. Possibly. Um, how many do I need to give? A uh, list, short list of things that might happen due to a large amplitude oscillations. Um, uh, with a large amplitude, uh, the string might break. I think I ask for a short list, hoping to get at least this answer. But this is actually an open-ended question. There's no necessarily wrong answer. Um, um, it, it's, it's a, you know, just brainstorming, which is not the best for thing kind of question when it's a time limited. Okay, six minutes. Let me see what's a D. Uh, oh, my book. Okay. <laughs> uh, is there anything else? Um, uh, we'll come back later. Okay, if the rope breaks, okay, then what is the rod's angular speed immediately before it crashes? Okay, so I am going to assume that the rod and uh, sphere are, are at rest uh, the moment the string breaks. Which might not uh, necessarily be a good approximation, but that kind of allows you to do the calculations. Uh, so um, so we are going to have to use the conservation of energy, uh, using conservation of energy. And let me see how much time I have. Five minutes? Yeah, I think I have enough time to set it up. So. For part D, we are going from the rod being in this position to the rod uh, falling down. 
so that it's going to end up in this position. Label these snapshots 1 and 2. And I have a sense energy is conserved, so I'm going to use conservation of energy. Say that total energy in snapshot 1 is equal to total energy in snapshot 2. So I'm going to track the rod and the sphere separately. So they will have uh, it's their own gravitational potential energy. So in position 1, I have the gravitational potential energy of rod, gravitational potential energy of sphere, and the kinetic energies are going to be 0. Uh, so I won't write them down. In the snapshot 2, I will set my y is equal to 0 here, so I don't have to worry about gravitational potential energy here. Instead, what I'll have is kinetic energy. Let me use rotational kinetic energy of the rod and the rotational energy of sphere, sphere separately. Um, and I'm going to make them rotate around this, uh, center, of, this uh, uh, center of rotation on actual fixed point. So with that, let me write down the expressions. The gravitational potential energy of the rod, I use the height of the center of mass. So it'll be uh, mass of the rod times g times the height of the center of mass, which will be L over 2 times the sine theta for the height, um, plus the, the sphere, capital M times g, L times the same sine theta. That should equal to the kinetic energy you get, one half. So the rotational kinetic energy is one half rotation inertia times omega squared. So, um, so rotational inertia of a rod spun about its uh, end is one third ml squared. I have it memorized. If you don't have it memorized, then you'll have to spend some time looking it up <laughs> times omega squared. Plus, they're going to have the same angular velocity because they are moving together as a rigid body. Sphere, I'm going to treat it as a point mass. It'll have rotational inertia of ml squared, mass times distance from the center of rotation. So, okay, I have this expression. Um, so I'm going to do this. First, to write, type up the equations. Uh, we, we solve for the following conservation of the energy equation m times uh, g times l over 2 times the sine theta plus n times g times l times the sine theta is equal to 1 half times 1 uh, ml squared over 3 times omega squared plus uh, 1 half times ml squared um, times omega squared. Um, solve uh, for the omega in the following. Um, so can I do this in my head? Um, possibly. So doing this you get omega is equal to uh, so mgl uh, yeah. I'm just going to write down the version that's not simplified so that I can do this, you know, this is the version that I can do in my head without writing anything down. That's the numerator, denominator is going to be um, ml squared over 6 plus ml squared over 2, and all of that is going to be square rooted. That's capital M. So... Yeah, I don't think it even really simplifies that much anyway. Um, so in the remaining time I have, one minute, I can simplify a little bit. And the little bit that I will simplify is uh, simplifying a little. You can cancel out the additional factors of L. Um, so there's one factor of L that can get canceled out. So it'll be, uh, you know, L's gone there. So you have like divide by 2 here for mg over 2, and that's gone, that's gone, uh, and that else gone. I think that's it. Oh, you can factor out sine theta, but the g sine theta, and that's just about it. You could uh, factor out g times the sine theta. Um, that'll give you that. It looks uh, slightly simpler, maybe. But not over, not, you know, very much so. Uh, I think that's it. Um, all that you can simplify.
and I'm probably out of time too. Uh, close enough. So yeah, and I don't think there's uh, any more that was in my list. I'm thinking and I don't know. In 10 seconds, I don't think I'm going to come up with something that I haven't come up with before. <laughs> so so that's the time. Uh, let me just uh, attach my work. So, you know, this is was uh, like half of it was actually topics that you have seen before, you know, static equilibrium and actually concert rotation, rigid body rotation. And uh, at this point in the semester, if you see something like that, that should not surprise you. Um, now, I want to ask you questions that are purely composed of formerly covered topics because, you know, we are not doing cumulative final exam and I'm not doing a backdoor cumulative final exam. But um, you can't forget what we covered before because you might get a related question where a good portion of the question relies on you to those previous knowledge. That's everything, and um, and we can check the answer key to make sure that I didn't make any mistakes. Um, yeah. Oh wait, I we can't check the answer key right now, and it's not under this account because um, you know test student like you doesn't get access to the answer key while uh, within the, um, the before the due date. So let me go into my instructor account and bring up this exact thing so that I can show you um, the answer key using the instructor account. Okay, here it is. So here's test the student's results, answers, answer key, and or, or the attached work. And now I can bring up the answer key as the instructor. Um, so you know, it goes through all that and I work at square root. Oh, I guess, um, yeah, sine it, tangent theta. It, yeah, you can write it out. Uh, let me see. So this is the version with the tangent theta, three j over four times. I think that's equivalent to that. Yeah. So okay, good. Um, other than forgetting theta was given numerically, I, that looks fine. Um, and yeah, so in the answer key, I'll have worked out. Um, actual final expression or you know i didn't really yeah because uh, you know plugging in t actually doesn't simplify anything that's why we are just saying oh use the t from above um, and the rest of it should uh, right i still forgot about the cosine theta being given you know 2l over 3 or the 4l over 3 cosine theta that's the wavelength um, Yeah, yeah, with the cosine theta being one half. I think that's right. Um, and so I don't know within the model answer, the tension might change. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, the length might change, especially if the rod is moving. The moving rod will cause the uh, the length of the thing to change. So yeah, that that's a possibility. <laughs> but it, you know, it's an open-ended question. So it, don't think of this as a close to list of correct things. There might be other possibilities that I didn't think of. Um, and here, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So the solution probably plug in the value of theta, or or not. <laughs> um, so square root of. Um, g over oh yeah i could have factored the l out of denominator yeah square root of g over l times um the numerator so i think it, this version here multiply top and bottom by two to get 2m there and sine theta is stuck with that and m over three plus yeah i think that um, looks right so yeah that's the um uh well, that's that's the uh, the answer, and so again uh, here you know the, the reason this question is in this set is like in the previous free from time assessment I couldn't ask you this question. That's why it had to wait until waves and oscillations uh, chapter to be asked. 